Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can head over to patreon.com slash aksum. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash a-k-s-u-m. You can also join the YouTube channel directly at $25 a month, $5 a month, or even $1 a month. Consider doing so, and you will see more and more of these productions. Today, we have... Araka Marha Gibru, the friend of the show, Deacon Marat, how are you doing this morning? Doing great, doing great, Diakon Hino. Thanks for having me on. Of course, of course. Uh, as I said, you're a friend of the show, uh, and we're able to uh, hit a number of topics with you. One of the things I wanted to uh, set up briefly and get right into is I know you've just completed the first semester of your college and I'm someone who's worked in uh, elementary schools. I'm actually working in elementary school now, but I've also worked in middle schools and, and in high schools. And particularly in Los Angeles, one of the issues that you hear educators complaining about the most and doing a lot of research on is what they call the dropout crisis and people dropping out of high school particularly. And the year that you see it happen the most is between freshman year and sophomore year. So some of them begin ninth grade and they don't finish, or some of them between the summer of ninth and 10th, they'll drop out. And, you know, some schools it's, it's crazy. I remember one school in the a documentary waiting for Superman, which I recommend to people if you haven't seen, it's a little dated, but it's, it's still good to watch to get a, a little introduction to the top of education for anyone who's interested. There was a school across the street from where I used to work in Watts that would start off with like a thousand or twelve hundred students, and they would lose about eight hundred in that year between ninth and tenth every year. And you just imagine what does that do to a community over five years, ten years, fifteen years? If if there's anything you know similar to that, and and as the church, it could concern you in one way, but you know honestly, I have a lot of ideas about trade schools and people having what should be considered honorable and prestigious trades like being a plumber or an electrician or a mechanic or so many other things that i think in our community just don't get the respect that they deserve because you can be a perfectly good christian and have any of those things it's not a requirement to have um, a master's or even a four-year degree or a phd but anyway the thing that's been on my mind for a long time and other Sunday school educators in the EOTC is that a lot of students that we see growing up in our system, and I mean, wherever you go, it's a different Sunday school, but particularly at, at Virgin Mary's church in, in LA, we have a very thorough Sunday school. We didn't have one when I was a kid. Uh, we just learned hahu the same row every, every week for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. But you know, at some point, I think throughout your childhood, there was a pretty good one. And yet we see a lot of people falling through the cracks. I had a parent just telling me just this past weekend how they want to do some gathering of the youth because they're gone. You know, they're, they're just not here. Some of them move to a different city or state, but some of them stay locally. And just um, when they're not compelled to go to church by their parents, they have uh, no interest. So it's a question of the seed of the word of God that has been planted. Where Where is it? What type of ground did it land on? So I want to address this question. Sorry, that was a long ramble. Uh, let me ask you in, in this uh, kind of brief way. How is it that you've maintained whatever faith your parents you know, helped you achieve up until your age so far throughout your first semester of college and along with that are there any other examples or are you just this rare breed yeah i think it's good the way you set it up i think it's perfect um so first off i guess talking about like the reality of the problem like it is a huge problem that our church uh, is is struggling with and it's a universal problem like in the diaspora i think anywhere you go uh, people have this problem on their minds that, you know, uh, the youth, they go to college and then they don't come back to the church. Like the moment they're free, you know, they're off the leash. They don't they don't have to go back. Um, and I think like, I guess I'll start from my own personal experience. I think the key to 
what like determines whether a person is going to return to the church of their free will or not is like to the extent in which the person feels like the church like belongs to him or her Mm -hmm. like that sense of like not just i belong to the church but also like the church belongs to me like it's my share it's my responsibility and you mean the universal one right not the parish that they grow up in no the universal one the universal one and of course it starts with a a sense of responsibility for the parish church but I guess once you foster that, I think it can it can turn into a sense of, of, of responsibility for the universal church at large. So what, what really what I'm getting at is like this idea of participation, like not just participation, but like a participation where the person is willingly wanting to participate in the church. Like there has to be a sense of of like loving participation. It can't, it can't be forced. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. And so like you know for me personally i remember since i was like you know in elementary school maybe even younger than that like i had just really like this desire to be like you know i want to be like the diaconat just for instance to take the diaconat as an example the deacons i want to dress like them i want to be like them and of course that starts out as being a superficial thing but then it thrives and then and then suddenly it's like okay well i want to serve as a deacon serve i want to be a servant of the liturgy i want to learn about the liturgy and then that thrives again. And then you say, well, you know what? Now I want to learn about like the history of like, why are these deacons serving the liturgy? What's the whole purpose behind that? And then you get into learning about the teaching of the church. And all of this takes you in this long journey, um, again, all coming from this willing participation. And it always starts from the outer, the, the superficial things, and then it works its way into the inside. Uh, and so it, it starts out with like, you know, really trying to get into the Qaddasi, the Mesmo, the Maharit, the Warabs and all that. And then eventually that just, you know, gets you in, gets you centered, it gets you tethered to the church. And then you you really begin to to examine what the church really has to offer in the midst of that outer um the outer things, the visual things. And you begin to see the inner sweet things. So uh that's I think really what has kept me in the church and what will keep continuing to keep me what will continue to keep me in the church is like that idea of like participation. Like I still want to to experience what the church has to offer. I want to to be part of the Mahari, the Kedasi, the the Sukkot, um, all of these different things. Uh, are you know the church is also doing a really good job as of these past couple of years of of doing youth things. Uh, you mentioned in our parish church we have Sunday school, which is great. Um, there are also, you know, wider youth organizations that are beginning to be assembled, uh, that have been assembled um, in different regions of the country over here in the U.S. that are trying to get the youth to kind of be the reasons for each other to stay. You know, even if you don't have the fear of God in you, at least having the love to want to be there with your with your people, you know, with your friends, to have like a clique, a group in the church where you feel tethered and tied to and you want to do service with them, and you want to minister with them, that becomes a reason to stay as well. So ultimately, I think it's like, you know, in scripture, uh, Christ says to the apostles that they're going to become not fishermen, but fisher, fishers of men. <laughs> I don't know. You know, you're going to, you're going to start reeling in people, not fish. And so uh, I can speak myself being a human fish, that the bait that has really kept me into the church is is just you know a love of the community a love of the service um and so that's my personal experience going to college uh over in boston i can also testify that again i'm not you know i'm not the only case this is not like what what happened to minerat alone uh i can you know i can tell you for sure talking to people um over there in boston and also just in the east coast in general i think they're very tight-knit in terms of the youth network over there in the East Coast. The people there, you know, there's a lot, plenty of them that are in college and they're still in love with the church and they're still trying to find a way to get to church. Uh, I know multiple college freshmen and sophomores. The first thing they did when they landed in Boston and, you know, cause some, some of the sophomores it was also their first time touching, um, you know, physically on campus because of the COVID year. The first thing they did is where can I find the church? Where can I find the church? Where can I find my people? Uh, and and the amazing thing is that really when you are tied into such a universal community like the church, you'll find your people in no time. You know, 
Like it took me two weeks. And then I found um, some someone of my age who said, who was willing to hook me up with a ride to get to church. And then you find people there. And all these people are, again, really interested in, 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 in being involved in the church. So then not only are they looking and for it's a the church. And it's an Ethiopian one you found? An Ethiopian one. Not just that, but they're looking for a church that does mezmur, that does mahi. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But they're looking for a church that has an appreciation for yari dawi zima. So people are going above and beyond. This is not like a rare thing. So it's proven there is a methodology behind it. And that methodology is, again, if you want to participate, if you want to take responsibility, then that will foster love. And the one last thing I'll leave just as my first remarks is that a lot of people are going to say, well, you know what? These are just because, you know, they're diaconat, like they're deacons. So, um, you know, that, that, that's the, the extracurricular that kind of gets them, you know, tied into the church. And I would tell you from my own personal experience that I've met people that are not diaconat, you know, people that are not part of the, the, the deacon club that are still trying to participate in the church. And so, um, Again, it's proven and tried. So the way we can tackle this problem, uh, and we can go into detail on as to how that can happen, but the way we tackle the problem is not starting in high school. It's like starting in middle school. It's starting back in the foundation, back in the roots. It's just like in secular school. Like the people that drop out in high school already had a bad, bad foundation to begin with. It were, they, they were in a sense already doomed the moment they entered ninth grade because they didn't have the proper support system. So in the same way, I would argue that a lot of these people uh, among the faithful, among the faithful youth that drop out, it's, it's because they were already doomed in the first place. They didn't have a proper support system. They didn't feel like they had a, a, a piece of the pie, a, you know, a piece of, of, of responsibility. And especially in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, that can be a very, very scary thing because we're intense to the, out, to like, to the outside, to the onlooker. We're intense. We have so many intricate things, complicated things that it would take people years and years to understand. And I can speak for myself. I'm still trying to learn more about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church tradition. So unless someone feels that they're belonging to this, you know, it's it's a scary, um, very unfamiliar, very foreign looking thing. So we have to do better at, at creating that support system, that foundation. But on um, uh, two things that you said that stuck out to me, uh, one of them is a point that Deacon Mahadi says a lot. I don't know if he said it on his program. He's another friend of the show, so sometimes you know, real life and the show they blend. But uh, he says often that you need to build a brotherhood or a sisterhood. Like that's what fraternity and sorority mean. That's why people, again, in the non-religious sense in college, seek out fraternities and sororities because that's where their brotherhood and their sisterhood is is found in these groups that do community service together, that party together, that in general build fellowship with one another. And so much stronger should be the Christian fellowship, the Christian brotherhood, the Christian sisterhood. So, yeah, I'm glad to hear the East Coast has those powerful networks. Uh, I think some of the older people have some of those in the West Coast, but maybe not in your generation. You, they, they aren't a bunch of views uh, up and down the West Coast and in San Diego, the Bay Area, and, and Seattle that, that you grew up with or stayed in contact with. Maybe more recently, I could think of at least one, huh? We'll get him on the, the podcast too, our Ken A friend. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's um, it's good to have those links and connections because then you don't feel alone. You know, my namesake, or at least one of my namesakes, the prophet Elias or Elijah, you know, is uh, very lonely and sad and depressed and despondent because he thought he was the only one. And in a sense, uh, not to put down people feeling those feelings, but there, there might be a kernel of narcissism behind that to think that God only has one person on his team. Maybe even idolatry if you push it in that direction. The, the other thing you're um, saying that stuck out to me is how, how quickly you were able to find it. It didn't take you a long time. I remember the story of a parishioner. We, we've had him now for a few years he had no idea about the scene and so he, his was much more old school he's a few years older than me his mom told him as he goes to la to move there he's like you better find mary church and he's like what's mary church and it's funny he has no idea about the la church scene and even where he's from he was not 
churched well in the way that you said. There was not that that foundation, right? So, I mean, one of the things about foundations I could tell you about, when I grew up going to church, I would go about once a month, and the time I would arrive would be the time of communion, which is already, what, two hours, two and a half hours into the service. And I see that with my own Sunday school students and with others. And, and that, I would say, at least in Southern California, from what I could tell, is the norm. So if the norm is arriving two hours late, the liturgy doesn't even have a chance to teach them. So what they have is the Sunday school alone and whatever the parents are doing for them at home. And so I think that speaks to the foundation. And so this is one of those people, but he comes to LA and he literally Googles Mary. And the first church he, <coughs> oh, mention, he calls, he said, nobody really answered. He called the second church, which happened to be ours. And he said, the guy on the phone could barely speak English. But he said he saw on the website that there was an English liturgy and he didn't believe it was true. He's like, is that true? And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he told him. So the first liturgy he attended was our English liturgy. And then from there, he got to build like one-on-one -on -one relationships with the father. And this is a guy who's like not on social media. So it was super old school. You know, his mom told him, you better find a Mary church. <laughs> he, he just looked up Ethiopian Mary church and just, you know, found it, called them old school, you know, no uh, DM or anything like that, right? It just called them, showed up in person, built those those uh, relationships in person. I imagine, Zoomer that you are, you have other digital tools at your hand. Um, I know that there's an app, the Tawahado app that I've seen before that has, uh, I don't know if it's up to date, but locations of all the Ethiopian churches everywhere. Uh, on a very practical note, because I, I really want people to take something practical. Could you explain like, what did you do? Did you go to Google? Did you go to DuckDuckGo? Did you hit up someone that you know and ask them? Like, what was the actual method for how you found, you know, the parish and then how to like plan your route there? Like, am I going to get a bus or someone's going to give me a lift? You figured that out. Yeah. Um, well, basically what uh, it's pretty much has to do with people, just people. Uh, you know, I found someone, a fellow freshman at my college who's also invested in the church. And, and uh, she was also in contact with a fellow deacon from another college in Boston. And he was also in contact with a group of deacons that were native to Boston that went to a church. And so all of that, you know, pieced together and I ended up finding a ride. Um, before that, I had been going to another church that was nearby. Um, uh, it was, you know- Also it was, Ethiopian? It was a nice church. Also Ethiopian, yeah, and the you know the people there also were were really accepting it and such. But uh, it, it it became pretty easy to find a church, not just because you could search up one online, but also like I said before, if you're like already connected into the system, you know, once you find someone that's also invested, there's like an instant link, because you know we, we both have the same mother, <laughs> you know, it's the mother church, so uh, it it really like it was very quick. You know, once you find someone and that person knows someone, especially again with like a well knit system, if you know someone, that person is definitely going to know someone. That person will know someone, and so it's just a matter of time until you find someone that's going to, you know, not just point you in the right direction, but like I said, offer you a ride. You know, offer you to come over. You know, after church, uh, if you want to have a Sunday Sunday lunch uh, with with some people, and so. Uh, Again, the fraternity that you're talking about is like very real, so real, uh, and it's a, it's an important thing. Like, what makes church amazing isn't just that we're bringing ourselves closer to God, but the fact that as we get to God, right, we're also getting closer to each other, uh, and that's like the beauty of of the church is like the fellowship among all of us who are made one in Christ, and so that is has to be a reality, especially for the youth. Because oftentimes our eyes aren't illuminated enough to see God. So in the meanwhile, we have to be able to see each other. And, and hopefully that will bring us to God. And hopefully we can see the image of God in each other. And that will allow us to, to draw closer to, to him. So that's, I guess I'll say from my perspective, that's how, you know, it was very easy for me to find a church. Again, I would say it's maybe quite hard, maybe not hard, but I would say harder. For someone that's not already 
you know, invested in the church and the community mm-hmm. and doesn't have people. But my whole argument, though, is for someone who is invested in the church, you're bound to find people. Uh, you just need to have that foundation built. And that's what we need to do is create a foundation first on a local level. And then, of course, on a regional level, which is what a lot of people in the church are trying to do is create that national you know, well-knit system so that when a person does end up going to college and they go to whatever it is, Boston, it could be LA, it could be Seattle, it could be Houston, Dallas, whatever it is, you'll have people there. You'll have people there waiting for you. People who, even if you don't know, you'll get to know quick and it'll be an easy chemistry. Uh, that's what we're looking for. That's the vision. Yeah. So uh, I have a really good question I want to ask you about hypotheticals uh, that would have been counterfactual, but actually I think something else will be more relevant on this point. Um, you sound like you had this this foundation, which is a confident identity of what your role is. And I think sometimes, and, and I've seen this even with Sunday school teachers, which I believe are people who are highly invested, but even Sunday school teachers I've seen move from one parish to another. Now I've seen some where they do it successfully and take on, you know, same or similar roles. But sometimes if you're a new face, you know, it's not as easy to do that. Now at our parish, you're not a new face at all. You know, uh, you're in the regular circle of preaching and teaching. You're doing the liturgy, the Eucharistic liturgy and the non-Eucharistic liturgies, which we'll get to as well. The matins or whatever we want to call it in English, the mighty. So how do you then go <laughs> navigating that at a new parish, you know, especially, you know, when you're younger, you know, you come up to the fathers and say, hey, I'm a famous preacher, you know, or you know what I mean? What? How do you find a new role or an analogous role? And are you, you know, are you comfortable with your role changing? Mm. You know, if you're more at the forefront, now you're more in the background. Uh, and it might just be a matter of time, but you know, is that, uh, and I don't want to get you too sticky if they're watching this too, but you know, like it's, it's an interesting thing that, that I've experienced as well. And, you know, I've moved a few times. Yeah. Well, I'll say it was very smooth for me. I'll say, especially because I was, I was going in with, you know, two other college freshmen who were going to this parish for the first time. So I wasn't the only stranger, I'll say. And especially one of them being a deacon, you know, we just both went went up to the to the to the priest and uh, kind of just introduced ourselves. And, and that worked out, you know, worked out fine. Uh, in terms of like a change of, of ministry, you know, again, I will say being a deacon has its privileges. You know, you're a deacon regardless of what church you go to, you know. As long as they they understand that you're a deacon, you know you you can enter the sanctuary, you can serve in the liturgy when you can. I will say, like again, like you said, you know, I'm used to teaching a lot um, over in my home parish in LA. That kind of went away going to another parish. You know, they didn't exactly have that space there for me to teach, but that's perfectly fine because, um, again, you know, you can't expect to have all the privileges that you have, all the ministries that you have in another parish church. Um, so that's perfectly fine. And I, and I, I found another ministry in the meanwhile, uh, you know, having the privilege to go to a church where there is a Margita and they do Muslim every week, you know, I learned a lot about Yari Daizima and about Mahadit. And again, the deacons and not just the deacons, but some of the non-deacons in that church are invested in Mahadit. And so, you know, they're, they're up at one in the morning, maybe sometimes, uh, 12 midnight you know, going to church. You have to say that again because people don't understand, like, and, and let yeah, them know, okay, like, yeah. how long they're staying up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, for instance, we have this period in the month of October called Zemanet which is very known amongst um, those that are, uh, you know, the faithful of the church, especially our our, our mothers and fathers. And Zemanet has with it what's called Maharita Zegi. And it's a matins that takes up the whole night. So, in Ethiopia, they're starting at like, you know, let's say we have a matins at Sunday. They're starting at 7 p.m. on Saturday. So it's an all-night vigil. 7 p.m. till exactly... 5 a.m. the next day. Exactly. So it's like a 10-hour thing. It's a 10-hour conversation with God. 
in a, in a diaspora, you can't exactly do that. But we were starting at 1 p.m. Uh, not 1 p.m. Sorry, yeah. 1 a.m. 1 a.m. 1 a.m. In, in the morning, and you have college kids, myself included, and all of us because we're so excited. You know, we meet together, we find rides, uh, and we're all we're all there. So, and and that was a new thing for me. I didn't have that that opportunity in the West Coast. Um, hopefully, in the future, we'll get that opportunity in the West Coast, my guy. But to have that was awesome. And then, of course, you have these different, the different Knicks, like, you know, Nikaid or whatever it is, where they're starting at midnight. They're starting smack dab midnight, middle of the night. And they're going all the way until, until seven, seven hours of, 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 of matins. And so all of this. Followed by the normal it, liturgy for another two, followed three by hours. The normal liturgy, followed by the, yes, exactly. <laughs> so it was a great, great experience. And also getting to talk to the Marigita there and asking questions and learning. And also talking with other deacons that were invested in the Mahanit and learning from them too. Um, you know, there is there's a deacon there in, uh, who who goes to a college there in Boston, very knowledgeable. I'm not going to name drop anyone, maybe because you know he doesn't want to get his name dropped, but you know, very knowledgeable on the Mahanit, very knowledgeable in the Matins, very invested in it. And so, just even talking with a peer gives you a lot of insight, and that itself is a ministry. So, yes. Things change, but I always believe that they change for the better. And so, now coming back to LA, I really feel like I've, I'm bringing a piece of what I've learned in that first semester back with me, um, in addition to the teaching duties that I'm going to resume. So that that that's um, that's my personal experience with it. Gurum. So, um, yeah, that's very good. So. The question I was going to ask you is more counterfactual, and then we'll jump into what you've brought back here. So the counterfactual is what if there was no Ethiopian parish? What if it was an Eritrean parish? What if it was an Egyptian or a Greek parish? You know, and, and those are all different, you know, but mm -hmm. take that wherever you will. W what would you have done? Well, you know, I'll say the Eritreans uh, or Orthodox Church, I don't really see as any different from the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. I mean, we're pretty much the same. And, and of course, you know, I have talked about, uh, you know, your great your great usage of, of language, you know, referring to the two of us, the Ethiopian and the Eritreans, collectively as the good is right. Um, because, again, our worship is the same. Our worship is exactly the same. Uh, you can go to an Eritrean Orthodox Church and you'll understand everything that's going on in the Mahadika liturgy. Um, everything there is going in the same uh, right as the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And not, not only that, I'll say, but uh, I'm seeing a lot of connection and ties between the Eritrean youth and the Ethiopian Orthodox youth. And the key to that, I'll say, has been Kudus Yadid, 100% Kudus Yadid. Kudus Yadid, in my opinion, has created a very wave, new wave of, of you know, the youth being invested in the church. And Again, the beauty of that is even though the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and the Eritrean Orthodox Church use a different secular language, our spiritual language, which is Giz, and that is, by the way, I will argue, the only language that is truly the language of the Giz, right? Because again, the Giz, right? right? What language are you using? It's Giz. Anything else is oikonomia, it's economy. So when people say Amarinya belongs or Tigrinya or whatever, like, sure, you can use that for Econ for economic purposes for your flock, but you might as well use English or Spanish as well. That's all economic. The only thing that stays, the letter of the law is goods. And so that has been a source of union I'm seeing between the Ethiopian and Eritrean youth, um, especially in Minnesota, I'll say. I have pe people there too that I know. I know some people in San Diego as well, Eritrean. Um, great people invested in the church and we have the link because we, we're both invested in the same thing. So. Uh, if there was no Ethiopian Orthodox Church, I would definitely go to the Eritrean Orthodox Church, 100%. If there wasn't the Eritrean Orthodox Church, we can continue the, the scenario. Uh, you know, I would still go to you know an Oriental Orthodox Church. Um, would it be different? Yes. Would it take time to adjust? Yes, it would. But again, the whole idea that I mentioned in my first remarks is that yes, we have this beauty and intricacy in you know the Ethiopian and the Eritrean Orthodox Church. But that intricacy, the purpose of it is to point us to like the deeper thing, which is Christ. So if, as long as you believe that Christ is present in the Syrian Orthodox Church, in the Coptic Orthodox Church, in the Indian, the Armenian, then if there isn't, your, if your mother church isn't there, then, you know, you have every reason to go there. 
And so uh, that is a danger, I would say. We don't want to get too carried into being invested in like the local tradition that we forget the holy and apostolic tradition, which is, you know, Christ, his body and blood. That's what everything is pointing to. The Mahdi, the Qaddasi, the Zimari, the, the Tanamogad, all of it is pointing to, to Christ. All of it. The Satat, everything is pointing to him. So, you know, that's that's how I would respond to that scenario. Malik Khan, and uh, thankfully, that was not what happened to you. So you had a much easier go of it, but you would have known how to traverse that obstacle had it been presented before you. So going to what you were saying about what you've been bringing back here, I, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong. For the first time, we had, I think, a more full celebration of one of the minor holidays of the Lord Jesus, which is called Sibkat, which means the proclamation or the preaching, the heralding, the announcement, whatever we want to say. And uh, you helped lead in that, obviously, with the the collaboration of our our fathers and that's one of the things you you brought to us i noticed that in in general this mahalet or this uh, this early morning singing this matins service that pre is before the eucharistic liturgy it typically if not always i don't know if it is always begins with could you say a little bit about that because that seems to be the most common element yeah yeah for sure um, so yeah, as you said, every Mahalit starts with, uh, Subhu Odus. Um, it's a very beautiful prayer and it's a biblical prayer too. Uh, so it starts with, uh, which is from the Psalms of St. David. He's saying, you know, listen Lord to my prayer, let my, my, my supplication, my, my shouting, Come before you. What you gets that come in there. Don't take, don't turn your face away from me. And so this is the supplication of, of David. And we start every uh Mahadith with this because again, the Mahadith, even if it's in honor of the saints or whatever it is, obviously the worship aspect of it is always directed towards God. So we're asking in the beginning of our pr prayer, we say, like, may our shouting, our supplication, you know, ascend to you. Otherwise, it's just shouting. <laughs> Let's be clear, right? If God doesn't accept it, it's just shouting. What makes it so beautiful is that we understand that Yari Dawi Zima is Yemadai Kumskana. In our tradition, we say that he received, you know, his the melodies from heaven. So what he got from heaven, we want to bring back to heaven. That's the whole purpose of Mahari. And so we say that. And then after after that, you know, we say, In my time of suffering, Lend your ear, bend your ear towards me. And then we say, When I call upon your name, quickly listen to me. And then we say, Forever and forever. And then we say, And so, here, is saying, which is you know hallelujah or hallelujah whatever you want to say um in the english but hallelujah is is a, a beautiful introduction to a prayer in our tradition almost any prayer of Qudusiari, especially in the Dugwa, will always begin with hallelujah it could be one it could be bamus basidist basid hallelujah 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 you know it can continue but it's always starting with that i think and there so, are 15 of them yeah, there's, there's a lot, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it can be really long. Sometimes it takes up half of the hymn. Um, but uh, when we begin the Mahadi, is is giving an uh, turguami for what Hadidiyah means. Because Kundusiyari isn't just, um, you know, the the uh, a founder of Zima, but he's also a founder of Kani, a founder of turguami. He's all of the Beitwich, whether it's Mas'af Beit, whether it's Kani Beit, whether it's Zima Beit, all of them find him as, as their father. And so he's saying, Hallelujah, So he says, Hallelujah, which means, which means we're going to worship um, he who is. Because uh, means, uh, he who was and is and is to come. God Almighty. I think this is found in Revelations as well. So 
it's a very powerful prayer. It's very sad. A lot of Westerners have taken this beautiful prayer and turned it into an ad lib, like like it's some kind of rap song. That's not what it is. It's a very solemn prayer, an ancient prayer that Lusadi is using. And so he says, He is subu, he is worshipped, wawudus, and praised, who established the entire world by his one word. And so this is a reference to, you know, just textbook orthodox creation theology, that God established, not just created, but established, meaning he kept the world existing by his one word, by the one Logos, who is, of course, um, God the Son, God the Word, uh, who in these latter days has come in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's Subu Wawudus, and it's it's the first prayer that we sing uh, with that, and I'd say with the Kavaro and whatnot. Yeah, and we didn't we didn't do the whole Timur uh, Tehubuat or the hidden teaching, but we had a little gursha or bite of it. So why don't you give my audience a little gursha of Timur Tehubuat, which I think has been translated in Amharic. I know they have the Tirugwame of it, which usually is more of an explication than a direct mm -hmm. translation. Um, but I don't know if there's just a pure kind of word to word translation of it, Amharic. I've never seen one in English. And so mm. interesting scholarship for people who want to do that out there. Uh, if no one does it, maybe I'll have to tackle it one day, but it very much deserves to be put out there. And if anyone does 100%. it, I would love to have them on my channel. Uh, but yeah, give us a, a little gursha of Timur Tawad. 100%. Um, so yeah, Timur Tawad, just to give background on what it is, because a lot of people might not know what it is. Um, uh, Diakon Hinok just translated like the title in English. It means the hidden teachings. Um, and the Timur Tawat is one of the, what we call like the Sabatu Kidan, Kidanat, uh, the seven covenantal writings of the church. Uh, and so these writings, we believe in our holy tradition, uh, Christ passed down to the apostles in the 40 day span uh, between his resurrection and his ascension. And so when we are using that kind of explanation when we say this like you know that 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 prologue it's it should be taken as a sign that this is an important writing like this is an important writing that the church holds in high esteem and high regard uh and so the Tawat is a very powerful writing and it's talking about again uh the hidden teaching what we would call in other orthodox terms like the mystagogy so it's a, a mystical teaching that's handed down to the Mimenan Hibwat. It says that in the beginning of the Timur Tawat. It says that it's Nagar Persephora the Mimenan Hibwat. So it's it's supposed to be said before the mystery, Persephora. Um, if you've listened to the Kiddas, they would use that term. Persephora is a reference to prosphora in the Greek. So it's a reference to the to the sacrifice, right? Um, and so it's it's, it's to be said to the faithful who are who are hidden and uh, this is a reference to the hidden tradition of the church the church is has a tradition of mystery uh and this is very important for a lot of us to understand not everything is supposed to be just said out <laughs> out loud uh something that blew my mind that i learned like last year is that in the early church they would teach our father who art in heaven that prayer as a mystery, a secret that was to, to be closely kept by the faithful. They wouldn't t teach you that prayer until, uh, if you were in the Western Rite, until Palm Sunday, because if you're going to be baptized on, on Pascha, on Palm Sunday, if you're in the Eastern Rite, on Maundy Thursday, like on Tzedot on Holy Thursday. So it's a it's a guarded secret. Holy Communion is another whole, a guarded secret. In fact, a lot of historians say that one of the reasons why Christians were so heavily persecuted was because the the Gentiles, and I say Gentiles here, not as a reference to non-Jews, but as non-Christians, because we are the spiritual Israelites now. They didn't know what was going on behind the closed doors. The liturgy, of course, has closed doors. After we say it's a Christian, you know, by the letter of the law, if you're not baptized, you scram. And after that, they hear things about people eating flesh and blood, and they say, what is this? They don't know. How come they don't know? Because no one told them. It's a mystery. So we have mysteries that we keep 
between the mimana, not because we think other people are inferior, but because some truths are to only be given to those who have received the Holy Spirit, who are illuminated. Baptism is a process of illumination. And so Timur is again sung for those who are for the hidden faithful. And the writings are talking about the revelation of Christ, of his coming, of how he was born, how he died and how he was resurrected, and talks about the kind of this, these deep theological themes by you know how how his death redeemed us. What he do when he descended into Hades to confront Satan, uh, talking about like when he ascended, why is his ascension so crucial? And and so in general, it's talking about the revelation of God. So it's talking about the revelation, the divine revelation. And the Timurita Wat is only sung four, uh, three times a year. Um, it's sung during Sibkat, Vada Sibkat, during Zemana Nulawi, which is uh, coming up. It's the last Sunday before the Nativity. And then it's also sung um, on the Feast of Theophany, or the Baptism of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Timkat. There is also, I've heard from the Rik Aunt, that in Beit Lehim, which is, uh, you know, back in Ethiopia, it's, uh, you know, the, the place, the certification house of Dugwa, Timurita Wat is also done on the Feast of Ascension, on Bala Irgat. So it's rarely done, but it's, again, uh, a very beautiful uh, zima. The particular stanza that is done with the, with the drum and also the tzanat says, Zawitu amnak zabaman. Zawinariyat akdama ta'awku. Wabahawayat tasabka. So it would say, this, uh, this is the, the, the Lord truly whom the prophets ask who, you know, previously knew of him uh, and declared him and was preached um, by the apostles and was praised by the angels and uh, was, was, was praised by the father of all. And so this is uh, what we're singing in the, in the Tarta Wat. Uh, and it's a reference again to the Sivka Tanariyat and the Sivka Tahawariyat, that the, the preaching that's being done by the, by the prophets in the Old Testament is a reference to Christ. All the preaching that was done by Isaiah, um, by David, all these prophecies are preachings about the one uh, who would save us, which is Christ. And also in the New Testament, the apostles, who are they preaching? They're preaching Christ. So whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, the subject of the preaching is Christ. And so that's what the Tantamad is teaching us. Amen. Uh, I don't expect you to have a conclusive answer, but you talk about how it's rarely done. Um, the Ascension piece, how it's done on the Ascension in Bethlehem in South Gwander is interesting as well. I had heard that. I follow the same show. Um, uh, the great Yitzbahal Zadigwa, for those of you who speak Amharic at Beta Tekle, uh, go over there and you could hear uh, Baile Mikael and Adikat Abab Tekle talking about that as well. It, what I was going to ask you is why do you think, because we have three minor holidays leading to Christmas, Sivkat, Berhan, and Nolawi, the preaching, the light, and the shepherd or the pastor, why is it that you think on the light, the in-between holiday, they don't do it? You know, that's a tough question. It's tough to kind of go into the mind of the leak on because again, you know, it's really tough. But what I will say though, I don't know why they chose Burhan in particular to not have to to watch, but what I do know is that um, there definitely is a need to have the Melka Yesus done at some point. Because in any Ba'ala that belongs to our Lord, you want to include Melchai Yesus. Mm -hmm. Melchai Yesus is like, it's, it's another deep spiritual prayer that our church reserves. And in fact, it's, we, you know, it's talked about in Yitma Hazadugwa as well. But the, you know, Melchai Yesus is talking about, you know, it, it uses a lot of different analogies, a lot of different metaphors and typologies as well to talk about, you know, Nagara Christos. And so uh, Nagara Christos is obviously like what you want to talk about. Um, you know, as you're preparing to celebrate the birth of Christ. So the Tempest Watch is very important, but you also want to have the Medica Jesus as well. Um, that, yeah, that so sounds have, very practical. And yeah. my only guess, and it's totally a guess, but you can call it an educated guess, is that, you know, Burhan meaning light, 
the light and the hidden teaching <laughs> a little there's a tension between the light and the hidden teaching so that on these two occasions on the preaching uh Subkat and Nulawi the shepherd or the pastor you have the hidden teaching but smashed in between you have the plain open light of the the malk uh the what was it is uh, either image or likeness whichever one we want to go with uh where where the body parts of Jesus are praised uh with mm. rhyming poetry and a kind of quicker melody uh, as you said and, and also i would say it also makes sense just if you think about like the pattern because ba'ada did it which is like the combination what what we're doing is mankai jesus on ba'ada did it so it makes sense you know you have to what mankai jesus what and then again on ba'ada did it mankai jesus it just makes sense that might also be another reason but i like yours yours is much more deeper <laughs> than one two one two so, it's a deep guess it's a deep guess is all all it is uh, but a guess based off of someone who has a foundation in the church uh as you do so i guess the final thing i'll ask you about before we wrap up and and obviously you can add your own kamam and spices if you have it as well but the mazmur is something that you've grown accustomed to each sunday has its own mazmur uh, actually the hebrew word i've been learning hebrew during the pandemic it's great it's mizmor can you believe that? It's a cognate. It's great. Uh, a spiritual song, right? Of uh, In the Juridian tradition or the, the tradition of Lusiarid. Each Sunday has one, but particularly these minor holidays have them. And you helped lead for the one in Sibkat. So could you talk to us about the Mazmur or the spiritual song of Sibkat? Yeah. So yeah, Mazmur is a very, very important part of the Sunday worship. Every Sunday, as you said, has it. Uh, and Kanusiari has a deep respect for Sunday as Saint Michael Christian. And so um, the Mesmur is is like one of the most vital parts of, of a Sunday. And and even you know um, the the full Sarat Dararis, uh, the worship is lengthened on Sunday because Sunday is the day above all days. And so that's why it, it's given its own um, you know worship service. Uh, and in, and it's very important that we preserve the tradition of Mazmur, especially because I'll say Mazmur already, even amongst uh, most of the elite, even in diaspora in Ethiopia, has been shortened. It doesn't have the the, the full Salat Adaradis that is is asked for that you'll see in um, done in, in the Wanbar. Um and so we have to protect that Mazmur from getting even more shortened. Which is why you know it's it's my deep deep belief that any church that has the resource and means has to have a scholar that can lead every Sunday that worship service because it's it's a you know it's it's one of our biggest wealth and resources. So the Sunday of Sibkat, um, the Mazmun is Waldo Madina Nisabik. Waldo Madina Nisabik means his son, which is a reference to God, God's son, the son of God, Waldo Zabiriel. Madhina, our savior, Nisabbik, we preach. So we preach his son, our savior. Uh, and so it's a short Muslim and it, and it says, um, So he who was before the beginning of the world. Then it says again, The crown of martyrs. So he's the one, who, the ordainer of priests. Uh, what has fa manakusat the 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 hope of the monks, and then we say waldo majina nisabik, and so what is this talking about? It's talking about how the the one who's coming on his way, <laughs> we'll say, the one who's coming to us and going to be born in a manger, is also the one who existed before the beginning of the world. So it's acknowledging the divinity of Christ. It's acknowledging the pre-existence of Christ. It's acknowledging the condescension of God the Son. And, and it's it's pointing at this mystery that how could someone born in a manger, how could someone with human flesh and blood also be at the same time the God of gods, King of kings, Lord of lords? How could he be the one who was predicted and, and, and preached and worshipped by the prophets? It's a mystery beyond us. But that mystery is the center of the good news of the evangelion of the gospel and that is that son of david is also the son of god the son of man is the son of god 
he's doubly con consubstantial. He's consubstantial with his father, but also he's consubstantial with us. And so uh, I said earlier on that in Timothy we're seeing how pre-Christ, the prophets preached him. Post-Christ, the apostles preached him. And now Kumjusari is telling us in the Mesmor, well, guess what? You have to preach him as well. You have to preach him. Every Christian has an obligation to preach Christ. Of course, that preaching doesn't necessarily have to be with words. Um, but in our life, we have to make Christ the center of our proclamation. Any preaching that doesn't have Christ at its center, whether it's verbal or whether it is in words or in, I mean, whether it's in actions, is idolatry. We have to get that through our minds. Any preaching that does not have Christ at its center, whether it's in words or in actions, is blasphemous. It's idolatry. At the center of every dome in an Orthodox church, we have that Christ Pantocrator icon, right? And so that's a reference to he's the center. Everything else revolves around him. He's the center of the proclamation. And so that's what we're singing with joy. We're saying, Wardo Madhina Nisabdik. And it's very beautiful, a beautiful uh, truth. And one that we have to try and live up to uh, every day. Thank you for that. May God have you hear his word of life. And I don't have to bother Deacon Mira to sing it because it's already on a channel. Uh, you could find a clip of him leading us and, and singing it and, and me and my wife hitting the cupboard or the drum along uh, with it. So that was very beautiful. Do you have any other closing remarks? Because uh, you and I are both debaters and we've talked about debate before. Or do you have any other words of rebuke or encouragement to get our people to celebrate Burhan and Nolawi and Christmas itself or Lidata Christos Christoganna in the Greek, I found out uh, not, not too long ago. Okay. Yeah, no, I would say um, it's important for us again. <clears throat> I'll say, okay, first with reference to Burhan and Nolawi, I think it's very sad that these feasts are just not talked about. There's a lot of other feasts that go on, that go on in the month of Taisas, and they're nice feasts. And I'm not going to name them because it's going to come off as if I'm bashing them, but I'm not. They're great feasts. But we do have to understand that Subkat Rahan and Nulawi are Nusan Ba'alat of our Lord. So these are minor feasts. And, and I know the term minor makes it seem like they're, they're lower, but the fact that they are feasts of the Lord makes it so that every parish has an obligation to celebrate them. They have instantly a higher priority than any monthly or annual feast of a saint automatically and yet we don't talk about them unfortunately that much there's not that much hype around them to use that term and so i would say maybe this year if we haven't managed to do it but definitely next year and we still have two weeks so even if you missed the cut you know you should definitely come for brahan for nolawi you should make an effort to learn the alex for these sundays um and of course what is the purpose of Sifkat, Burhan, and Nulawi? Well, these are um, weeks that are leading up to Christmas, to Badr um, al So, of course, you know, when I say come to these Sundays, that doesn't mean, oh, I went to Burhan and Nulawi, so now I have my off for January 7th. No, <laughs> it means that all the more you're supposed to come uh, January 6th at night and stay with us as we keep vigil um, until the... Uh, birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom is due glory. Um, the last thing I'll I'll say with um, with our remarks is talking about what we were you know discussing in the beginning of the podcast, and that was like about participation. And I would say you know participation is doable by anyone, uh, whether you're male or female, because I've seen both genders do it. I've seen people of different ages do it, and so it's never too late. What we have to do is we have to have different. There's always good different and there's bad different. And so I'm urging you to have the good different, which is the confidence to ask questions, one. The confidence, two, to put yourself outside of your comfort zone. You know, how about instead of coming at seven, you decide to come at six in the morning and see what's going on. And then maybe after a couple of weeks, you say, you know what? What if I sleep early Saturday and I decide to come at five in the morning and see what's going on? And then what if after Kandasi, I talk to my friend who I know is friends with the deacon, and I, I arrange to link up with this deacon and ask him questions about what, what was going on at five in the morning? Or what if I ask around and I find out that there is actually a, 
a series going on in, uh, on YouTube called Yitma Zadigwa. That's in Amarinya. So I decided to learn what's going on in that series. Or I find out that there's a website called EthiopianOrthodox.org. And I say, oh, well, there's resources there. Let's see what's going on there. Or, you know, whatever it is, looking at resources, finding people, making friends. Um, I won't just keep it with the Yari Daoizima. There's also, you know, youth events that are going on. Sunday school, Sunday Timothy, involving yourself with that. Um, the church has a lot of things to offer. And yes, the church has a lot to work on in terms of being more approachable for the youth. But we still have resources to offer even now in the status quo. And so 100%, you know, people can do it if they want to. It's just a willingness. And of course, we pray that the Holy Spirit will give them that willingness. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what I have to say. Thank you so much again for coming on to the program. Thank you, Jacqueline.